Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. First up, he's the guy who's really looking forward to when Omnath gets his fifth color. That's Matt Morgan. This weekend, I updated all of my passwords to Kenny. So now all I have is just a bunch of Kenny logins. <laughs> I Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know, Matt, you probably shouldn't give that information out. People will know how to get into your accounts. You might say I like to live in the danger zone. <laughs> Despite that, that joke, I, 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 I'm feeling all right. That's oh, okay. No, just this Joey, is, meet me halfway here. I all right. So Joey, the other come hanging with the boys. <laughs> no, no, you only get one joke, Matt. Anyway, the other voice that you're hearing, he's the guy who's looking forward to probably sometime in 2023 when Omnath goes full circle. He's been collecting too many colors, and now he decides to start ditching colors instead. That's Dana Roach. Well, to prepare for that moment, I've been digging through some old EDH. Uh, manuscripts in the basement and I found an obscure ruling I think people have forgotten about. If you kill somebody with a sign in blood, they have to become your butler until they actually beat you back in the game. So what? don't let anybody oh. try to get away with that. They have to now come to your house and answer your door. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, true. that begs the question. Then. True. I, I, Dana, I refuse how... because I just don't want to call you monsieur. <laughs> Dana, how many butlers do you have? I just I'm have curious. one. Just have one, but I'm I'm always looking to add to the um to the household yeah. staff. That is that is still Im impressive. I got it. Okay, wait. What happens if you sign in blood yourself to zero life? Uh, what do you have to do then? You have to clean your own room for the first time. <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, despite all of these jokes, welcome to the EDH RecCast. This is, in fact, a podcast where we talk about EDH and EDH Rec. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we'd like to do is give all of that data a little more context, in addition to telling some of the worst jokes that you will hear all week. Uh, guys, what is it that we're actually talking about on this episode today? This week, we're talking about landfall and all its various iterations. That we are looking through some of the most popular uh, land-based and landfall-based commanders, especially the different ways that those commanders like to approach win conditions, and then hopefully applying all of the lessons and all of those different types of uh, things that we can learn from them to the new landfall cards and the new land commanders that we're getting in Zendikar Rising. So it should be a really fun time, but before we get to our main topic, we have to give a huge, huge thank you to Josh Lequai and the folks at the Command Zone podcast. They handle all of the post-production work on the podcast and make it look as awesome as it does so thank you guys so much and of course we want to thank our sponsors for the show too so our amazing sponsors cardkingdom.com and tcgplayer.com both help keep the show coming to all of you the viewers and the listeners so if you just are at edh rec you can click on a price link either to cardkingdom.com or tcg player whatever vendor you prefer that will take you right to the vendor that will let them know that you came from us and you are supporting us or you can just go to cardkingdom.com slash edh rec which is what i did last thursday i submitted an order and today is monday i got that order in the mail two business days such a great turnaround quick delivery tcg player also the same so many different sellers all over the place both amazing sponsors that help keep you uh, entertained by some of these terrible jokes that we have. So cardkingdom.com <laughs> and tcgplayer.com, both sponsoring all the bad jokes. You can also go to patreon.com slash EDH if you want to support the cast. Um, there are different tiers there available, ranging from a shout out on the show to an invite to our Discord. There's a, a chance to offer up a challenge of stats, which you'll hear one from a listener later on in the show. You can get early access to shows. You can even get some EDH Rec merch. That's at patreon.com slash EDH Reccast. And hey, Dana, you mentioned patron shout out as one of those perks. Who's the patron that we are shouting out this episode? This week, we're shouting out Laurel McGinley. So thank you very much for supporting the show. Thank you, Laurel. Yeah, thank you, Laurel. One of our one of our EDH record keepers, a really fun patron tier. As if you thought that the puns were only for the show. <laughs> no, they're also on our Patreon. All right, guys, let's get into our main topic. We are talking about landfall. So what we've done is we've chosen a couple of different examples of landfall commanders to basically just go through and look at the ways that those landfall commanders tend to win the game, because that hopefully should help us figure out how we want to evaluate the new cards that we're getting from Zendikar Rising, because there's a ton of new landfall stuff happening in Zendikar Rising, including a bunch of new legendary creatures with really crazy land-based abilities. So let's figure out basically how we feel about landfall landfall as it currently is in the meta to see 
what those new cards will do to maybe shake it up a little bit. Um, so we're going to get into some commanders, but actually before we start, we're going to talk about two uh, pretty famous landfall-based cards, I would say. And uh, Matt, I feel like these ones have to go right up your alley because I know how much you love to make those tokens, right? I do. I, I love these cards. I play them both in lots of decks. Uh, that is going to be Avenger of Zendikar and Rampaging Baloth. Both of those are kind of signature cards, not just of any specific landfall commander, but just the landfall theme. If you're playing landfall, chances are you're probably playing green at this point. And these are just two amazing creatures in those strategies. Avenger of Zendikar uh, comes down and it creates plants for every land that you control and then has an actual landfall ability to put plus one plus one counters on all those plants that you control. It's an easy way to make an army both that is very, very wide, but then it creates that army to be very, very big as the game progresses. So both of these cards appear in over 50% of landfall decks. Avenger of Zendikar going up to almost 80%, depending on the commander, uh, whereas a Rampaging Baloth, anywhere from 50 to 70% in pretty much all of the decks that we are going to talk about. So we're not going to talk about them specifically because it applies to every single commander <laughs> that you, you might want to be playing. Yeah, absolutely. Like we could repeat ourselves a whole bunch of times this show talking about Avenger of Zendikar and Rampaging Baloths, but yeah. they are showing up in over half of all the commanders that we're going to be talking about. And they are great win conditions for a landfall deck. Those tokens can get really, really, really nasty in landfall strategies, but we just don't want to be repeating ourselves constantly bringing this up. But like right out the gate, this is a good way to contextualize, hey, one of the signature things that landfall decks always do, one of the quintessential aspects of landfall is creating big tokens that can then attack our opponents. So it isn't just that we're winning with lands, quote unquote, we're actually also winning with combat damage. And that can be really useful to sort of figure out how it is that you want your landfall deck to win the game. Uh, let's move now to some other classic examples. And Matt, I'm actually going to hand this one right back to you because this is a commander that you have used to wipe the floor with me. Um, tell us a little bit about Omnath. So Omnath, this is going to be the second version of Omnath we're going to talk about. Omnath Locus of Rage. It is three red, red, green, green for a 5-5 five, five legendary elemental. Uh, has a landfall ability of whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you put a 5-5 five, five red and green elemental creature token onto the battlefield. There's those big tokens you were talking about, Joey, but there's even more. So whenever an Omnath Locus of Rage or another elemental creature you control dies, Omnath deals three damage to any target. Uh, so you have those landfall abilities, you have all those token abilities, and, and five fives, those are nothing to bat an eye at. So it's it's not hard to imagine you're just doing a beatdown plan. But there's also some other interesting cards that people are playing on here. Uh, Where Ancients Tread is kind of a really, really cool card, um, where it's an enchantment that's four and a red. Uh, whenever a creature with power five or greater enters the battlefield under your control, you may have War Ancients Tread deal five damage to any target. So not only are you getting a 5-5, five five, but you're getting five damage as soon as it comes onto the battlefield. That is insane when you combine it with other cards like Warstorm Surge. So <laughs> this card, I love it. This is probably my longest living deck that I've ever had because it is so much fun. It can be extremely powerful uh, if people don't get rid of Omnath right away. Oh, absolutely. This one's insane, but I love that Omnath really feels properly red because it isn't just about the creatures dealing the token with the damage. Like that is certainly a classic way that you can win with Omnath, but you can also be like Dana and sort of have that proclivity to go over the top and deal just direct damage right to someone's face, which is something that I think interests folks like Dana a lot more than just always swinging into the red zone. Yeah. I'm just a very versatile commander. I mean, the landfall ability is obviously really, really effective, but you can very much just build this as an elemental kind of tribal deck built around sacrificing elementals, dropping a firecat blitz or a temp of vengeance that are X mm -hmm. spells that drop, you know, small elementals that aren't really a threat for the most part in combat, and then just sacrifice them all to an edge of the altar or something is just going to kill people. So that's a legitimate way to build the deck that's, that's not as reliant on land necessarily as some of the landfall decks uh, and it plays really really effectively i've seen that deck before and died to it multiple times so it, it's a neat commander in that there's two very um versatile and effective build paths you can go with here 
Yeah, let's move on to another landfall mander though. Adding in another color, adding black to the mix, we've got a really classic Lord Windgrace, the planeswalker who can discard cards from your hand and if they're lands you draw extra cards, he can revive lands from the graveyard and he's got an ultimate that destroys a bunch of stuff and gives you some tokens. The win conditions that we see on Windgrace's deck are also pretty varied, which makes me really, really excited. There are of course the classics, the token makers that we mentioned earlier, but then we've also got cards like Obnixilis the Fallen and Retreat to Hagra and those are landfall abilities that drain life from your enemies. So again, you're going over the top there. It isn't direct damage. It is instead taking life away from opponents. And that, I I mean, I just love that. If you can dump like 10 lands onto the battlefield in one go, these can be lethal in a completely different way that doesn't just rely upon combat. Yeah, I've seen some pretty devastating Lord Windgrace decks. Um, having access to black gives you some really interesting cards. Like you said, Retreat to Hagra is very, very versatile. Just having the opportunity to have two different modes whenever a land enters the battlefield uh, gives you a lot of flexibility in a lot of different situations. But even stuff like Squandered Resources, I know it's a more expensive card and, and probably more famous for being played in Gitrog monster decks. But Lord Windgrace, I've seen use that card to great effect as well. Yeah, and another cool thing about Windgrace is that he doesn't just have life loss or combat damage as one of the win conditions. Another really popular card that we're seeing for him here is Torment of Hailfire. It shows up in uh, over 40% of Windgrace decks, and that is just a big mana sink. Another really big fact of landfall decks is that they're going to have access to a ton of mana, so that can be another really effective way turn not just the act of playing lands into something to kill your opponents, but also just use all that mana to kill your opponents too. And that's a, a pretty fun thing to see, I think. I had a Wind Grace deck for a while. I quite enjoyed it. Joey likes it when the black cards drain life from the opponents. It's like he's got a type and he plays too many black decks and loves Golgari too much. Anyway, I think what we should do is move on to our next commander. <laughs> Our next commander we have here is Tatiova Benthic Druid in 2,400 decks. Um, the average land count here is 39, and Tatiova is a is a Simic commander, so we're getting away from a little bit the the green red that we've had in the the two previous um, commanders. The the most frequently played cards here are Retreat to Coral Helm in over 50% of the decks and Lanowar Scout in similar cards that go fetch lands. But the most important thing here is probably Laboratory Maniac and Thassa's Oracle as straight up win conditions in this deck, as well as Psychosis Crawler. So, so this is a deck that's much more kind of combo oriented than it is direct damage orient like with the previous two commanders we talked about. Yeah, and the specific, uh, the Land of War Scout and other stuff uh, that you mentioned there, those aren't quite, they don't fetch lands, but they do put them from your hand onto the battlefield, which you can then use with cards like Retreat to, to Coral Helm to then untap those so you can redo it, to untap those so you can redo it. So it becomes like almost this combo finish that leads into those Laboratory Maniac. Your deck is empty and you just win the game outright, which is a completely different direction for Landfall decks to win than the other ones that we've seen so far. That, that's one thing about, about Landfall that's, that's really interesting is it's kind of a subsection of what you would call maybe lands matter decks, but there's so much overlap between one strategy and, and the next that it's really easy to build a very versatile deck, number one, that has multiple paths to victory, whether it's the big creatures we talked about or whether it's going wide with tokens or the, the damage in Omnath. You can put all those paths to victory in a single deck and not feel like you're necessarily diluting your strategy because every deck runs lands. So since lands is the key, you can have those multiple paths in one deck without really feeling like um, it's tough to find one way to go since they all interplay. Same thing with Tatiovi here. You're not like just stuck draw, trying to go straight to that, that lab man or Thessa's Oracle win condition. You can get to them, but you can also do a bunch of things along the way if that doesn't work out because lands just work so well with so many different strategies. I mean, it is really hard to get land screwed <laughs> in a lands matter deck because if you're playing 40 plus lands, like chances are you're going to get to play in every single game. You're not going to be missing too many land drops early. Mm -hmm. So it's it's nice because the people that are playing these types of decks, they're making sure that they're hitting land drops early, which is a big thing that I think a lot of people, especially with mm -hmm. some of these, these weird spell lands that we're seeing, um, it's going to lead to some interesting deck building situations where lands matter decks, they don't care. They're going to play 50 lands now because eight of their spells also happen to be lands. I would, I will say, actually, I do prefer that scenario to some of the data that we're seeing a little bit here. Yeah. Dana, you mentioned that uh, Tatiova runs an average of 39 lands. 
Not gonna lie, that sounds a little bit low to me. And when we were talking about Omnath earlier in the show too, he also apparently runs an average of only about 39 lands. And I do use the word only there. I feel like those are pretty low numbers. It might be something that we revisit later on, but make sure, I think that 40 plus, really ought to be where you're going. Anyway, let's uh, let's move now to our next commander and see a different way that Landfall sometimes interacts to get to the win. This is the Gitrog monster. And, and can you tell that I was just really excited to talk about the Golgari Landfall card again? Uh, I have We type, can sorry. tell. We can tell. Yeah. Well, this one only runs an average of 38 lands, but in this particular case, I think it might be forgiven because this is another commander that uses lands as a method of combo victory most of the time, according to the data that we're seeing here. Its primary win condition is definitely combo because it uses discard outlets like the card Scourge Familiar, which can discard cards from your hand to get mana, and it combines them with cards that have the dredge ability, which will mill you instead of letting you draw. These all show up in like the high 40, high 50% area on Gitrog's page. The strategy is that you'll discard a land, you'll get a draw trigger from the big frog, you will dredge instead of drawing that card, you'll get a draw trigger again when lands get milled from the deck because of Gitrog, so then you can discard you can discard the dredge card from your hand with your discard outlet skirt familiar and keep doing this for infinite mana. This sounds so convoluted, Joseph. <laughs> it does sound convoluted, but it's combos, so of course it's convoluted. And they also, another big thing that we see on this page, Gitrog uses a ton of the OG Eldrazi that shuffle your library when they hit the graveyard to make sure that he never runs out of cards to draw. Those are all in huge numbers on his list. So in addition to making huge tokens and swinging with people, this is another commander that really likes to rely on crazy combos to win the game too. I mean, I remember at a certain point in time, we looked at a report of what commanders have the most overlap from deck to deck and the Gitrog monster was number one for a long time. Uh, the <laughs> most homogenous commander out there of all the commanders was the Gitrog monster because so many people were, were running these crazy combo finishes, milling out their decks and drawing their decks. And it was, it was weird. Um, I've never actually seen one really go, but I've heard so many stories of them just being insanely hard to deal with. All hail the Hypnotoad, that's all that I can say. <laughs> all right, there's another example of ways that uh, lands will sometimes interact into a, a cool type of win condition. So Dana, tell us about our last one. The last commander we have here is Rada Heart of Keld, who's a what might be one of the newest ones here on our list we'll talk about. Um, Rada's three mana for a three three. As long as it's your turn, Rada has first strike, but the relative or the the relevant abilities here, you may look at the top card of your library at any time, and you may play lands from the top of your library. So it gives you an extra uh, a way to have access to lands to play them, and that's before we start dealing with things like top deck library manipulation, with which Green has some access to. Um, you can also spend six mana and give Rada XX till end of turn, where X is a number of lands you control. So we have a Voltron Lands Matter commander here, which is not something we've really talked about prior to this point. Yeah, and I this is why I love Rada so much, to be honest, because there are also plenty of creatures that just get huge based off the number of lands that you have. Dana, I've specifically been crushed by a Rubble Hulk in one of your lists. Rubble Hulk shows up in like 40% of Rada decks because it just is enormous, equal to the number of lands you have. So it isn't just the playing lands, it's also sometimes just the having lands. And in Rada, case, having lands equals Voltron commander damage, and uh, ow! Yeah, and, and again, this is a deck where you can have that as your primary win condition, but you can also have the Avenger of Zendikar and overrun everybody in here, or the Bayloths and overrun everybody, or a, a card we, I can't believe we haven't mentioned yet, Valkut the Molten Pinnacle, is a fantastic <laughs> card in almost all of these decks. That can be your like fifth tier win condition, and it's still crazily effective. Yeah. Especially when you combine it with Dryad of Elysian Grove, as you have on twitch.tv yes. slash yes, EDH <laughs> Retcast. <laughs> oh no, you guys. I just, I had to fit it in, I'm sorry. But but it is true, like there, the Valakut is such a powerful card. Um, and so in all of these decks, Valakut is going to make a, a pretty big impact. Well, outside of like Tatiova, obviously, and, mm -hmm. and Get Rug Monster, <laughs> but... The point stands like it, it is an extremely powerful, just a closer of a card. Uh, Escape Shift is another card that shows up mm. in a lot of these decks because you get so many landfall triggers out of just one spell. Yeah, I just the 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 thing that we see, especially with a whole bunch of those, is it isn't just about the act of playing these lands from your hand. The graveyard becomes an enormous piece of the landfall strategy. Mm -hmm. So cards like Escape Shift, no, it's not just that they give you a bunch of landfall triggers; it's that they put a bunch of lands into your graveyard so that 
you can then get them back with things like a splendid reclamation. And then that will get you a bunch of, for instance, Omnath triggers or Tatiova triggers. Like it's just absolutely delicious to see the different things that this type of strategy can do. And I think that it's really valuable for us to make sure that we interrogate the concept of strategies. Like landfall is a really big blank name. It's kind of a vague term that encompasses a lot of myriad different types of strategies. Like if you say that your deck is an artifact deck, that has just as many different types of ways to win within the strategy of artifacts. Is it a Cheerios deck? Is it storming off? Is it using a combo? Am I being dealt a bunch of combat damage with flying Thopter tokens? Like there's a whole bunch of versatility within these different umbrella terms. And so that's why we wanted to go into some of these different commanders. There are of course tons of landfall commanders, but these are some big examples of different ways to use the strategy. So now bearing all of that in mind, what we want to do is apply the lessons that we see here to the new cards in Zendikar and see how they might fit into the existing umbrella of landfall. Of course, before we get there, what we have to do is I think we got to challenge some statistics. We're going to challenge the stats. There's a whole bunch of data on EDA track, but we don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think the cards are seeing too much play. Sometimes they're seeing too little play. So what we'd like to do is challenge those stats. Matt, start us off with challenging the stats this week. So this week, I'm going to bring a, a little bit of a deck that I've been working on. It's been a lot of fun, um, but one of the most fun cards in this deck is Terror of the Peak. So it's three red red uh, for five, four dragon. And the, the big ability is whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. Now, that's pretty great. There's a lot of fun commanders. You're seeing a lot of Kalia players. You're seeing a lot of different decks that are playing all sorts of fun effects with Terror of the Peaks. But one card that's only showing up in 11% of these decks, and I think that is way too low. So silly, so low. And the card actually got very, very cheap thanks to Double Masters recently, but that card is Sneak Attack. So three and a red for an enchantment that says you can pay one red mana, put any creature uh, from your hand onto the battlefield, that creature gains haste, and then you sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So if you look at the average deck of Terror of the Peaks, you are playing some monsters. You're playing stuff like Dragon Lord Atarka with eight power. You're playing all sorts of just massive demons and dragons and anything that you would write a song about in Wizard of Oz. Just, oh my. So... <laughs> What I think people should be doing with Sneak Attack is just put, spending one red mana to deal however much damage they want to any of these targets. Terror of the Peaks is so powerful. It's kind of a Warstorm Surge on a stick. Um, and Warstorm Surge is a card that we talked about where whenever a creature enters the battlefield, it has the same effect. Deals damage to any target. So with Sneak Attack, you're able to put Eldrazi into the play at instant speed. I know on a game that we stream together, um, I snuck in blockers with Hornet Queen and all sorts of little things which doesn't do a lot of damage, but if you're playing mono red and you have Terror of the Peaks in your deck, take a look at Sneak Attack and what other big things you can sneak in. Maybe you're a little mana screwed, you can't play some of these expensive threats. You can still sneak them in, get a Terror of the Peaks trigger, and then they also has haste to attack. So since Sneak Attack has recently been reprinted, it's about 10 bucks or so. I think people should be picking these up a little bit, take advantage of the reprint um, and put them in decks, especially with Terror of the Peaks. Matt, that was quite the love letter to Sneak Attack Terror. Right I, there. <laughs> I do love it. I, I had a lot of fun with it. And that, that's pretty much the reason I even made the deck because Sneak Attack is a pretty fun card. I snuck in all sorts of recursion engines and then you sacrifice it. And then I cast a Joey card, Living Death. And that was... Yep so much fun yeah no i i'm you're making me relive some really horrific moments but they were really good moments for you i can <laughs> you, fully you, admit. i'm sure you had the proud papa moments <laughs> I, I, very very much all right i'm gonna move on to my challenge here this is a card that we have actually challenged in a way past episode but i want to revisit it here because the numbers haven't moved on it and that's just incorrect and i figure as long as we're talking about landfall this is a card that we need to address this is the card stone cedar hierophant it is a four mana one one human druid whenever a land comes into play under your control, you untap the Stone Cedar Hierophant and it has the ability to tap to untap target land. You know how Lotus Cobra is really good because it gives you mana whenever your lands enter? Stone Cedar Hierophant is also really good because it gives you mana whenever your lands enter, only it can untap things that make two mana or three mana. It can untap any land that you want. This thing's so good and it only shows up in like a thousand decks. I'm looking at it right now, 1112 decks. That is far too low. This card's amazing. We challenge it again. It, it needs to be in your landfall decks. Play this one. It's super budget. I love this one. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna write the love letter like Matt did, 
excited, but I, I am going to gush about this card. It's really, really good. So um, while I look fondly at this card, Dana, go ahead and tell us about your challenge. Um, my challenge of stats here is from a Patreon supporter. Uh, Karel in our Discord suggested Sunhome Fortress of the Legion as being an overplayed card. It's in over 6,000 decks on EDH Rec. Sunhome is a land... Um, it can tap for a colorless mana, or you can spend two white, red, and target creature gains double strike until end of turn. So here's what Karel wrote. Uh, Karel said, you don't really have ramp in Boros, so it's really difficult to take off a full turn to give five mana to uh, add double strike to a single creature. Utility lands are nice, but honestly, this is just a waste way too often, and you're probably better off running a basic land than hoping you have a chance to actually use double strike. You maybe kill a player one turn early, and it's cost you five mana to do that and set you back how far. I tend to agree with that, having played Sunhome a bunch of different times in decks. On occasion, you find use for it, and I'm not saying that there aren't decks where it's really, really effective, but I think, you know, when we mentioned this when we talked about our, our modal spells on, on our show last week, the opportunity cost for that. How many times do you have to play around that colorless mana not providing you with what you need in order to have that one situation where having double strike on that land saves you? Um, whenever I've used it, it's felt like the amount of times it was a problem was way more... Um, happened way more frequently than the number of times it was actually really useful. I feel like that's probably true for a lot of people that are holding out for like that that perfect moment and don't realize how many issues it causes along the way by by just not having it be a good land that's useful every single time. Yeah, that, as long as we're talking about lands here on this episode, not just landfall, but also the lands themselves. Make sure you take a critical look at those utility lands and how often you're using their utility. Yeah. All right, so that's a really cool challenge. Thank you so much, Corral. Yeah, thanks a lot. We appreciate it, and we appreciate your support. All right, fellas, let's get back into our main topic now. Looking at Landfall, we're going to now move to the new cards from Zendikar Rising. Let's start off with the Commanders. There are some new legendary creatures that have some pretty interesting abilities relating to lands and new Landfall stuff that they can do. Uh, Dana, start us off talking about Phylath the World Sculptor. Uh, Phylath, the World Sculptor, four red green. So this is a Gruul commander, legendary creature elemental, and Phylath is a 5-5. Five, five. When Phylath, the World Sculptor, enters a battlefield, create a 0-1 green plant creature token for each basic land you control. And it has a landfall ability. Whenever a land enters a battlefield under your control, put four plus one counters on target plant you control. So it's Avenger of Zendikar-ish as a legendary creature. I mean, I'm kind of into it, specifically that this twists up the formula, so we're not relying on one big, huge army. You can actually just buff up a single plant token. You can use a harrow like it's a combat trick. You can use fetch lands like they're combat tricks. Oof. Those all sound pretty interesting to me. I kind of love this. I don't know if it strikes me a whole lot like the original red-green Omnath in terms of its win condition, but uh, Matt, where are you? You're the resident Omnath player, after all. I mean, I think one thing that people are severely underselling. They're saying it's a legendary Avenger. It's close, but it's not quite there. The big thing that I think people are glossing over a little bit is that when he enters the battlefield, uh, it only counts basic lands. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are just assuming it's all lands. And so the reminder of you're only getting plant creature tokens for every basic land you control and already have out, that's going to be very interesting when you are going into the deck building process. So keep that in mind. But now that I'm thinking about it and reading it, I also misread the landfall ability, putting four plus one plus one counters on one creature instead on all of your creatures. Mm -hmm. um, you are right. Yeah, Harrow gets into really sticky combat trick area. Um, so any of those instant speed putting lands on the battlefield, swell of growth, anything that just instant speed gets lands onto the battlefield, that's going to be very, very interesting. I do like that, um, but I think that we need to keep in mind, okay, this is not actual Avengers Endicar, but this is a, a pretty fun version. Having access to this effect in the command zone is going to be fun. I think it'll be a fairly popular commander. I don't know if it can compete with the other Omnath, but I no. love this in particular 
because of its unique divergence from Omnath. When I said earlier that I don't think it'll have as much in common initially with what Omnath can do, because it makes a bunch of tokens and Omnath loves to deal damage with the cards that we saw earlier, like the uh, Warstorm Surges and stuff like that. This is actually going to be about making one big creature. Yeah. So you can sculpt the Phylath deck around that one big creature by, I don't know, throwing in cards like Chandra's Ignition, maybe, to take advantage of the high mm -hmm. power of the one big creature. That's a new direction that you can take this to take advantage of the really big like that sounds like a whole lot of fun to me and it's also a little bit new compared to some of the other stuff that we're seeing so i really dig it yeah i mean fling fling's gonna be really good in this deck yeah but i think even if it doesn't fill a niche avenger is such an iconic card and it is so popular that giving people the ability to play with something very similar is probably good enough. Uh, one of the things we've talked about in the past is whenever we get some new variant on a mono red legendary goblin that makes goblin tokens, the conversation we always have is, well, this is fine, but Krenko exists and does the same exact thing and probably does it better. Um, I, I, so, so I think that's a reasonable question to ask is what niche does it fill? However, maybe the niche this fills is, it's Avenger Vendicard, it's cool. Like maybe that's that's enough. Yeah, yeah. I think for a lot of people, is uh, unlike a slightly worse Cranko, people will want to have a fairly close approximation of Avenger of Avenger in the command zone. And I think that's probably good enough. Yeah, I think it's gonna like it may not be the most competitive or most powerful commander, but I think there's lots of casual appeal, and I think that's you fine. Bet. I think a lot of people are going to attach themselves, like you said, Dana to, oh, well, it's as close to Avenger of Zendikar as I can get, and that's good enough. And I yeah. think that's that's fine. I think it's going to be a very fun commander for sure. I think I'm probably going to be got by, you know, the fact that I just now reread it and I'm still learning things about the card. So it's it's fun. It's it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, and it's going to be, you know, there's going to be a, a decent amount of people playing it. Yeah, this one, I love that it takes a bit of a twist on what we already understand from the archetype. And frankly, that is also true of the next commander that we're going to discuss, Obun Moldaya Ancestor. This is a four mana Naya commander. He starts as a three, three at the beginning of combat on your turn. He turns one of your lands into an XX elemental creature with trample and haste until end of turn where X is Obun's power that is still a land, the one that you animate, all of the pretty classic stuff there. But the real cool part here is that whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. So again, you can pump things up at instant speed, but you can also just pump up Obun's own power to then also make a really powerful trampling land assistant during combat. This one strikes me a whole lot having similarities in kind with the Rada that we discussed earlier, where you can get some really sick commander damage beats with this particular one. You can, of course, do all of the tokens if you want, but I see a commander damage victory happening with Obun a whole lot more than any of the other landfall commanders that we discussed. I, I hold up, hold up, hold up. What, what did you say the commander's name was? Obun, Moldaya Ancestor. Oh, I thought it was Obun. Because <laughs> uh, I think there's five E's in there, or five U's in there. If five I, if, U's, if, yeah. Yeah, if I'm reading that right? correctly. So it's Obun. I'm going to use your Kenny logins to ruin all of your accounts. You make bad <laughs> jokes now. What uh, are you thinking about new Naya? You love Gruul, you love Selesnia. Are you into the new Naya, or is this too much of a departure from the other landfall stuff that we're usually seeing? It is I, a little I, different. Yeah. I, I think we're talking about talking about niches again, and one of the things we went through with the old landfall commanders, we talked about, hey, this one's Gruul, this one's Simic, now we have a, a Jund one, now we have you know a, a mono green one, which we didn't even get into the first the first Omnath, um, I think giving people a chance to play Landfall in Naya, again, is probably enough of a reason to play it, even if it maybe doesn't add a, a super unique twist on Landfall. It's going to let you play the Landfall cards people love, and it's going to let you do a slightly different version of that deck than the one your friend is playing because it's a Naya. I think that's enough to appeal to people, and I, I think this will also be a relatively popular commander just because Landfall's popular and it lets people have their own twist on Landfall. Well, and I don't think we've had too many really good landfall type commanders or lands matter commanders that had access to white before. Yeah. And right. so I think that's going to be a, a big point. Same with the next Omnath that we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, having a lands matter type commander that has access to white is something we haven't really seen before. So I think 
how people explore this space and some of the new cards that we're getting with landfall or just lands that matters all of a sudden. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I, I'm not super excited about this compared to maybe Phylath, for example, but I think Obun is is fine. Uh, it, you're going to be able to build up a very, very big creature, whether it's the land that you're powering up or with Obun himself. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what people do with this. I think plus one, plus one counters is going to be a very popular, obviously, sub-theme in these decks. Mm -hmm. But as far as land, fall, land, land matters specifically, uh, I'm not really sure because I just don't know what to, what to expect with having white in these decks now. Well, one thing worth noting about Oboon here as well is <laughs> white does have access to multiple different ways. Number one, just to give all their things indestructible at instant speed is, is a white thing. But there's quite a few mm -hmm. white um, enchantments or things along those lines over the years that also give just lands in general indestructible. So it's there's never really been a good place to play those in Commander. You probably aren't running an enchantment that makes lands indestructible just on the off chance someone casts an Armageddon. But here, where you're going to be animating your lands and giving them counters and probably swinging with them, this is a chance to then like bring those cards into this deck and give it, again, some kind of unique feel over the Gruul landfall decks or something that don't have access to do those kind of things. I'm telling you, this one has commander damage written all over it to me. You've got your Boros charms. This guy can pump himself up. You can double strike it. You can give the land you animate double strike. This is much more along the lines of like the rubble hulky type of win conditions than I see all of the tokens. And the token seems like a really nice plus. Matt, I love what you said about plus one counters being a good theme for this one as well. This opens up some new doors that I'm really excited about. You mentioned also, though, that there's another landfall commander that has white in its color identity. Let's move on to that one. So Omnath Locus of Creation is that commander. So it is the four color Omnath now picked up the access to white for a 4-4 elemental. So now a red, a green, a white, and a blue for that legendary elemental. When Omnath Locus of Creation enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and it has quite a bit of landfall text here. So whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you gain four life if this is the first time this ability has resolved this turn. If it's the second time, you add red, green, white, and blue, so one of each color that Omnath has. And then if it's the third time, Omnath deals four damage to each opponent and each Planeswalker you don't control. That is a nice little board wipe for Planeswalkers and just hitting folks for four damage isn't really to shake your head at either. Uh, what are you guys thinking? I know we're kind of torn over here, but I've, <laughs> I've seen a lot of people very excited about this at the same time. Well, that's just it. You said it's nothing to shake your head at. And and yes, that is true for folks who are looking to combine all of the different iterations of Tom of Omnath, including the Teamer Omnath that we didn't even actually discuss yet. You can put the Tatiova in here and then you also can play Oboon in this deck now too. Like there's a place that you can put all of those. But with that said, this is a very confusing set of abilities to see for me. I'm... I, I feel like I'm missing something. Like what I want to do when I see Omnath is find a way to construct some type of engine that will allow me to put lands into play on every turn, including my opponents. That way I can get that four damage trigger as often as possible. And there are a couple of really clever ways that you can do that by manually putting them into play with cards like Walking Outless or using Fetch Lands. But it's kind of weird to be reaching for that goal when the second part is that you get mana which I probably won't even be able to use successfully on other players' turns. It feels like the payoffs of these abilities are very restrained compared to the other things that we've seen Omnath be able to do already. Well, I think the abilities are restrained in a casual environment, but I think that's a good thing. I think part of the problem with cards like Tulane or Korvald, who we absolutely complain about a lot, um, is... There's another really good commander if you want to play Landfall right. and Jund. Yeah. Korvald's actually really good at it, too. It's true. Um, um, but, but the problem with those commanders is because the abilities aren't constrained, um, not, yes, they're obviously really good in like a CEDH environment, but they cause problems outside of that because the abilities are so powerful and so easy to have access to that they wind up becoming very centralizing and focus entire games around them because they're just accidentally hyper strong. I think Omnath Locus of Creation is a card that isn't going to do that. You can play Omnath at a six power table and the game isn't going to revolve around how strong Omnath is. However, if you want to build that food chain deck, excuse me, or the infinite flicker combo CEDH variant of this deck, you can do that too. So I, I think at least 
from a design perspective, it's quite well done in that it can play at that high power level without causing problems at a lower table just accidentally. Yeah, getting extra land drops is something that, like you said, at, at lower power tables, it's a little bit harder to pull off. Like, yes, you have stuff like Evolving Wilds, but you're if you're playing at, you know, the the five level or the six level, you know, power table decks, you're not probably you're probably not buying, you know, your your full set of fetches for the deck. You're probably not mm -hmm. spending, you know, a bunch of ma money. You might, you know, have an Oracle of Moldia that you happen to get out of a pack, but that's about it. Um, I think that if you really want to do that, and, and I was you you said something that I was thinking too, Dana, you have white access now and white does flicker effects really, really well. So that might be something new if you are able to reset Omnath, play some more lands, get a bunch of mana and, and hit people with big X spells. That might be a, a direction you can take it without going full CEDH. Um, but Joey, kind of like what you were talking about, you want to be able to hit lands on everybody's turn. I mean, you have access to four colors now, which means you have how many different bounce lands in the guild colors. And if you combine that with secure a tribe scout, I believe was a card where you can just tap it to put a land on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So combine that with retreat to coral helm. You have that same combo that we talked about a few weeks ago in Tatiova decks. You just spam that, you, you know, you tap it, put the land into play, you get the, the, uh, the retreat to Coral Helm trigger, untap your your tribe scout, you pick up the bounce land, you put it back into play and repeat that process over and over again. You basically get infinite landfall triggers that way. So with Omnath out, if you have a way to reset Omnath, yes, you, you can kind of go crazy. That's one combo finish. I think there's a lot of combos that are going to go into the Omnath deck. None of them are decks that I would put together probably, but like Dana said, that, that's tempered. It was a really clever on the design side of things where it's not too crazy powerful if you don't want it to be but if you do want it to be crazy powerful you can still do that uh, I, I know a lot of people in 60 card formats are talking about this for standard but also people are talking about this for commander and that doesn't happen a lot where both types of formats are talking about a certain commander yeah there is certainly a lot of appeal happening here it just does strike me that this is one of the landfall commanders where it feels as though it is not necessarily always going to be a participant in the method of victory compared to some of the other stuff that we're we've been seeing you know the red green omnath for instance he's usually a pretty active component of the engine to deal all of the damage whether it's because he's making the tokens or he's using his own damage ability or get rock monster is specifically using his ability as part of a combo. This new Omnath feels a whole lot more to me like it's the sum of the parts within the deck, not necessarily uh, he is always going to be an ingredient in the main engine that causes this deck to win the game. Yeah, and I think that's definitely a, a fair way of putting it too. It's It, it can be both though, and, and I th that's maybe why so many people are finding that you know this new Omnath is appealing is because yes, you have that fourth color, but there's a lot of different things that you can be doing with this and not one is terribly obvious over another. Right. So should we jump over and look at a couple of legendary monocolor creatures here as well that can be served as a commander if you want to go the mono route and they also slot very easily into any deck. Uh, the first one is Morog, a Fury of Akum, six mana for a Minotaur Warrior, six six, which is not nothing on a commander's body either. Each creature you control gets plus one, plus zero for each time it has attacked this turn. For each time it has attacked. So that's a stacking ability, and that matters because Morag's landfall ability says whenever a land enters a battlefield under your control, if it's your main phase, there's an additional combat phase after this phase. And at the beginning of that combat, untap all creatures you control. So you can basically use landfall to stack multiple combat steps with this crazy charging minotaur. That's a pretty new way to uh, use landfall. This is delicious. I'm sure it makes a beautiful commander in its own right, but lordy, I am so interested in slamming five lands into play with this guy around. Like so many of the commanders that we just discussed use combat as a method of victory because of the big tokens, and this will let those tokens trample, 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 trample. Uh, trample. I missed a couple of tramples <laughs> in there. Trample, trample. Yeah, it's very much just one more win condition to put into your landfall deck, kind of regardless of what the deck winds up looking like, if you're playing landfall and you have access to red, this can probably go into your deck and probably wind up being a win condition. 
Yeah, a fun commander for sure. I'm probably more, I think people are in more danger of using this too much in non-landfall decks than we are in danger of overusing sure. it in landfall decks. This one's really, really crazy. Uh, another legendary creature that we're seeing here is Ashaya Soul of the Wild, a five mana elemental with star, star, power, and toughness. Its power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control, but also non-token creatures you control are forest lands in addition to their other types. And this includes Ashaya. This is a pretty strange one, turning your creatures into lands. I'm not sure that I want to use this in the 99 of too many decks. Oh, because you hush, sir. Crazy talk, uh, Joey. Prove me wrong. This this thing is insane. So first off, the, the most fun thing that I've noticed about this is it makes you, well, at least your creatures, because it turns them all into forests, it makes them cyclonic rift proof, which is insanely important mm. if you have seen any of the games that we play together. Uh, <laughs> this gets very, very big very quickly and i mean if you're even if you're playing uh ashaya as a commander you can play stuff like primal bella which is just a, a one green instant target creature gets plus one plus one for each forest you control that is insane like as a nice little combat trick if you have any sort of army built up you have a bunch of lanor elves you have all those different mana dorks that green has great access to I think this is going to be a very powerful card, especially in the 99. Uh, well, I'm uh, consider me proven wrong, I suppose, but I am most interested in using Ashaya uh, in conjunction with cards like Oblivion Stone, which destroy mm -hmm. all non-land permanents. Yeah. That sounds like the most fun application to me, so it sounds more engaging as a mono green uh, commander to me to be able to constantly use uh, act, like effects like that, because there's also cards like Perilous Vault that have similar abilities. That is a weird type of control for mono green that we don't see very often, and I think that's uh, especially, especially fun. There's a lot of good applications here, though, as well. It's synergized nicely with the uh, Multani that we got in Dominaria a couple years back, mm -hmm. who cares about the amount of lands you have um, in play in your graveyard. This is by, by turning your creatures into lands, makes your Multani even bigger. Um, by letting your, but by making your creatures become forest lands, it kind of gives you an out around Blood Moon as well. Or lets you run Blood Moon more comfortably, perhaps, in your in your Gruel deck if you want to do that. Um, it's a it's a really really interesting creature and is going to feel really good swinging at somebody with and then dropping that um, berserk on them or or hitting them with with any of those kind of surprise smack to the face spells like Rebel Hulk. I, I will say though, it is a little discomforting to be running a commander or a card like that that can be destroyed by a ghost quarter. And that's also like saying your enchantment creature can get destroyed by a disenchant though. I'm I'm not worried about that at all. I am right. more worried about being able to turn my Miri into a forest and tap her for mana and then <laughs> get my defensive abilities like this. This card is so good. I I love Ashara or Ashaya. Uh, it, it's going into the 99 of probably three of my decks, I would say. Oh, wow. All right. That's all right. OK, consider me proven wrong then. Um, we need to move on to some of the other cards that we're seeing that interact with lands in this set. We don't need to linger too long on this next one, but I just need everyone to know that I'm in love with it. Its name is Ancient Green Warden. It is a six mana five seven with reach that lets you play lands from your graveyard. So I'm in love. But also it doubles your land triggers when the lands enter under the battlefield. This thing's beautiful. I don't see any reason reason not to run this in all of the decks that we've named so far and probably more than that it's wonderful it's beautiful it's a mythic you should play it i love it and we can move on i, I mean it's, you mentioned ugh. putting it in as many decks as you can though joey i'm gonna try it in mono blue and mono black and see if anybody notices it's just that good. <laughs> i mean it's that's so what green so does green is the best yeah, black card right. ever so yeah. uh, green is really good this card yeah this card is absolutely just silly powerful uh it, it does everything you need it to do i we, we yeah we don't need to talk about it because it's just insane just spend the twenty dollars yeah. get however many you need but yeah it's it's you know such a good it. card yeah you know you want it twenty dollars on one of them excuse me but do it at cardkingdom.com slash edh rec. <laughs> there you go. Uh, an interesting green card that we're seeing here that is, I think, a little bit, first of all, it's a lot less pricey than the other one that we just discussed. This is Scoot Swarm, a three mana 1-1 one, one insect with landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you create a 1-1 one, one green insect token. But if you control six or more lands, you create a Scoot Swarm copy token instead. Um this one's not very expensive at the current time of recording, and I don't think I can fathom why, because this looks, if you'll forgive the pun, bug nutty to me. <laughs> 
Well, and, and I, I really adore the fact that it has the same exact flavor text as Scoot Mob did. It did. Yeah, absolutely. This is a frankly disgusting win condition. And I don't I, like it. It's so good. It, this is really great because the thing that Landfall decks do is put a lot of lands onto the battlefield all at once. You can get copies upon copies upon copies. They won't be as big as some of the other tokens that we know Landfall decks can make, but it is called Swarm for a reason. And if you can pump these tokens like we know green can do, this thing will get completely out of hand. This is, of the Landfall cards, this one is way high up there for me. And that's a it's a pretty solid card to play in just a general token deck too. You're you're in sure. green. You're trying to make land trying to make a land drop every turn anyway, which is going to make you a one one insect just for doing the thing you were going to do. Maybe it'll be at the point in the game where you can make another copy of Scoot Swarm instead when you play that land. You're in green, so you're probably running things that ramp you out lands just accidentally. So it's just a really solid card in general in plenty of decks, and it's one more way to 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 go wide with tokens if. That's what your landfall deck wants to do. Well, the next one up here that we're going to talk about, uh, it's a little bit higher on the curve. It's not that Scute Swarm isn't great, um, but Trove Warden is the next card we're going to talk about. It is two white white for a 3-4 cat beast with vigilance, has landfall when, uh, whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, exile target permanent card with convert a mana cost three or less from your graveyard, and then when Trove Warden dies, put each permanent card exiled with it onto the battlefield under the control of that card's owner. So it's a nice little recursion engine, a little weird, but when you combine it with landfall, if you're getting multiple land drops per turn, it's one of those interesting white cards that has landfall we haven't really seen too much of yet. We haven't, but I have to make a confession here. I don't think I like this one so much in landfall decks, actually. Like, it is cool, the synergy that you can use to crack a fetch land, and then this card can exile the land from your graveyard, but this feels to me like it contradicts a lot of the stuff that we want to be doing with our landfall decks. I want to be getting all of the lands out of the graveyard en masse with, like, a splendid reclamation, or playing them just straight out of my graveyard. And Trove Warden might prevent me from, I don't know, I just, I usually like graveyard interactions, but this one doesn't quite tickle my fancy. The, the, the selection is pretty slim for good cats in an Arabo deck. I think that's where this is just going to wind up going a lot is the Arabo yeah. deck that, that doesn't want to have to run just that bad cat that has first strike just to get up to 22 creatures. So this goes in there and they make some landfall triggers just because you're, again, playing in green and you're going to get some occasional land ramp and you'll you'll get a couple permanents back now and then for, for an added bonus. And that's going to be better than the, the bad cat you're already running. And that's probably where it gets used primarily and not much beyond that, I would guess. Yeah, I, I don't think this is a card that you want to compare directly to stuff like Splendid Reclamation yeah. or, or some of those cards because I don't think it's going in those decks. This is more of a how much just incidental value can I build up? And I think that's fine. It's going to be a, a fine casual card. Um, but yeah, it's just a nice little engine. The only thing I don't really love about it is that it's a dies trigger. It's not a leave the battlefield right. trigger. So if somebody hits it with, say, Swords to Plowshares, for example, you're going to lose all those cards that you exiled with, and that is going to stink a little bit. Um, but other than that, like I think it's a fine card. I don't think it's going to be you know played in mass, but there are going to be places where people are like, oh yeah, in my Boros deck, I would like a little bit of incidental value just for playing lands. And this is going to be just, just fine in that position. Yeah, it's one of those cards that says landfall on it, but I'm not actually sure if it's a landfall card. It's not a landfall card, no. I, I think our next card kind of falls under the same category. Geode Rager is four red red, so six mana, which is already pretty pricey for a four three elemental with first strike. Geode Rager's landfall ability, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, goad each creature target player controls. So we're seeing goad come back here. Um, again, I think this is probably not a card you generically just run in your landfall deck to abuse that trigger. This is something you're running in your deck that's built around doing goad kind of things, and landfall is just the way that you fire off that goad. I love this card. Hold up. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the, I'm actually with Matt on this one here, Dana. Geode Rager is a lot better than I think everyone's giving it credit for. It's so good. This says if you play a, like an Evolving Wilds, you can't be attacked next turn. Yeah. This is something you can even hold up the Evolving Wilds on your turn so that on someone else's combat, if you're afraid of them playing a hasty creature, you can then crack the Evolving Wilds, go get a land landfall trigger. Their hasty creature can't attack you now. Like This thing's insane. It can totally be used in more defensive decks like you were saying, but using this in a Lord Windgrace 
to pre like just prevent anyone from attacking your planeswalker cat man uh, this i love it i love it i would agree with all of that if this was the same casting cost as a scoot swarm i think in the six mana slot in a landfall deck there's 15 absolute bombs you can run that that, that change games much more radically than Geode Rager. So, I, but you got to think, you know, Disrupt Decorum is, it, it's four mana, which is goad mm -hmm. all creatures you don't control. Mm -hmm. This is a repeatable source of goading people. And that mm -hmm. that is so important. I mean, the fact that if you are playing it in a dedicated landfall deck, you are never going to be attacked. It is an insane defensive card, which you don't see in red. But even if you're just playing it in just a, a normal red X deck, even if you're just making sure the most powerful person doesn't attack you, uh, say I goad your your Adelies, for example, Dana, that's pretty powerful because that's going to buy me enough time to you know maybe find enough removal to to get you out. I think this is such a good card. I, I do agree with Joey. I don't think people are giving this enough credit. You, you guys didn't convince me. I still think it's the uh, Edwana Rear. There's a lot of other things I'd rather devote that six mana to in a landfall deck all, than, all, all than you're telling messing me, with combat steps. You're going to put this in decks and you're going to love it. The same with the, the Fiery Emancipation. It's the same thing I was thing just about to happen. make the same observation. Yeah, Dana was lukewarm on Fiery Emancipation when we discussed Core 21, and then he's the one of the three of us to actually play it. Watch it be I exactly the same I never said I wasn't going to run it. I just didn't think it was anything we hadn't already seen. That's what well, I okay. I'm just saying of the three of us watch you be the one who plays geode rager instead of either of us. That's that's really great. All right, let's move on to a couple of other final landfall triggery cards that we're seeing in the set. The next one is Felidar Retreat. It is a four mana white enchantment with a very cool landfall ability for every bit that I maybe was kind of hesitant about Trove Warden. Felidar Retreat definitely has my interest peaked. It can landfall, create you a 2-2 cat beast creature token, and it can landfall, put a plus one counter on each creature you control, and those creatures gain vigilance until end of turn. So good. Now that sounds amazing. That lines up beautifully with all the token stuff that we've been seeing throughout all of the other win conditions that these landfall decks want to do. I am very afraid of, especially the defensive capabilities of this card. This seems bonkers good. This is this is really good. Like this, this is probably the best kind of retreat-esque card that we have in this set. It's very, very powerful. It's gonna see play in more than just landfall decks and just, yeah, it, it's it's a great card. It, it's like a seven quadrant card. It's good in landfall. It's it's good in token decks. It's good in plus one counter decks. It's good in cat decks. It's good in beast <laughs> decks. Um, it's just a really, really good card that's gonna show up in a whole bunch of different places. And it's never gonna be the kind of thing that comes down and you're like, oh God, the game's over. It's just gonna generate value and be really effective all the time in a ton of decks. Plus one counters, not just a temporary yeah. plus one. Right. On each, like, on I each think it, creature. Each creature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's really, really nice. It synergizes just beautifully with what you want to be doing with all the tokens that these decks can make. I'm very excited for Felidar Retreat. So it'll be uh, of the white inclusive landfall decks that we've discussed, the other commanders earlier. Honestly, I'd be interested in playing them for Felidar Retreat almost more than playing them for the commanders themselves. Yeah. All right. Bold. That is bold. That might be a bit of an overstatement and a slight exaggeration, but I really like Felidar Retreat. Like, this is a saucy card. So I want to talk about a card that is very interesting that I think a lot of people are going to be playing in the red decks. Uh, now, here's Litho, uh, Litho Forming. Excuse me. Uh, X red red for a sorcery. Sacrifice X lands. Draw a card for each land sacrificed this way. You may play X additional lands this turn. Lands you control enter the battlefield tapped this turn. Now, Joe, you've talked a lot about having cards in your graveyard and lands in your graveyard. This is a mm -hmm. nice way to do it. And you're drawing cards, you're getting extra land drops. I'm actually, I think this is going to combo really, really well with stuff like Splendid Reclamation with a lot of those different cards. But I know that a lot of people are kind of torn on it. What do you think? I do think it's a lot of mana to get that effect. Sure. You do have to pay X to sacrifice the X, and that does have me a little bit hesitant. I usually prefer something like Azuran Orb to allow me to sacrifice the lands just whenever I would like. But at the same time, sacrificing all of the lands manually, drawing cards, and then particularly pairing this with an effect that allows you to play the lands out of the graveyard immediately, for example, like the Ancient Green Warden that we mentioned earlier, that does sound pretty decently appealing, not going to lie. I do think it's a lot of mana, but I can also mm -hmm. see, especially some of the cards that allow you to sacrifice lands can be a little bit pricey sometimes, um, not in terms of mana, but in terms of actual monetary costs. So if this card is a budget version of that, definitely here for it. 
And, and I think X doesn't have to be a huge number. X for two, where you sacrifice two lands that are tapped because you tap them for the cost, draw two cards, play two lands that you presumably had in your hand, or maybe one of them that you drew over the two cards you drew. You now have lands in your graveyard that you can reuse with whatever effects are reusing your lands. If you happen to have Splendid Reclamation, you can do a really big thing and you know sacrifice a bunch of things to draw a bunch of cards and Splendid Rec to bring things back for a bunch of Alaku triggers. So I think it, it is kind of, I, I wouldn't say modular, but it's scalable. You can use it for a blowout card if you are in that perfect situation. You can use it for a little bit of value if you only want to spend X for two. Um, the question is, is it good enough or consistent enough to find a slot in these decks that are filled with so many amazing landfall cards? And I think that's the struggle I've had. I've already been trying to find a slot for it in my landfall deck. And right. there's just so many good things that like the the competition is more the problem than how effective it could conceivably be. So I like the card. I'm just not sure if I like it enough, maybe. Yeah, I, I get that. You just especially when you consider this is a massive set that has so many good cards yeah. that we're talking about already. Like th these lists are going to get very, very tight these days. I do agree. Quite indeed. And that is definitely true because of the last card that we're going to discuss here. The final landfally thing, this juiciest of morsels, Valakut Exploration, a three mana red enchantment that says whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, you exile the top card of your library. You may play that card for as long as it remains exiled. That's even if the Valakut Exploration is no longer in play. But the weird catch on this is not a catch at all. At the beginning of your end step, if there are cards exiled with the Valakut Exploration, they go to the grave graveyard and then Valakut Exploration deals that much damage to each opponent. This is an engine to help you find more cards to play. This is a damage dealing win condition if you would like it to be. This card is delightful and I am very afraid of it. It's it's very good. It, the fact that it's it's kind of like the impulse draw that Red has been getting where you exile a top card of your library or exile top X cards and you can play them until end of turn. But this has a twist where instead of just they go to exile and then they disappear, this goes to the graveyard. So you're not actually losing any cards by playing this. And the fact that when they go to the graveyard, you are getting damage from that. That's just gravy. And it's each opponent. It's such a flexible card. I love this. I, I think a lot of people might be looking to replace stuff like Outpost Siege with Valakut Exploration just because there's so much going on here. And it's just it's just great. Like Mono Red decks should probably be looking to play this in general. It's pretty playable if it was just a first paragraph of Landfall yeah. text. Yeah. The fact that you have this second paragraph and you don't feel like that instant spell that you maybe didn't have enough mana for is going to waste. It's going back to your graveyard where you can do something with it, um, like a physics mastery or something. The you know the 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 two lands you got if you only play one for the turn, it's going to go to your graveyard where you can then crucible it next turn or something, and it's doing damage in the process. It's just that that second paragraph turns it from being a really good card that I think we'd still be talking about to a fantastic card in some decks. Yeah, these, this set is full of some obnoxious landfall goodies. And yeah. that is kind of why we wanted to start off the show by talking about the other landfall commanders and where their win conditions kind of lie. Because this, by all rights, the Valakut Exploration feels to me like a red version of Retreat to Hagra. Like, this is a very fun way of just going right over the top and you don't have to rely upon creatures necessarily as the only way that you're going to win a game with a landfall deck. There's so much that you can do, so many other different types of ways that you can take your landfall deck and to, like, it, it's just so much fun to see these, but you can also, with the huge bevy of legendary creatures that we have now, it might be worthwhile to ask specifically how it is that you want to win most with your lands to figure out which of the commanders is right for you based on how they most plan to win the game, and especially then to see how these new cards will fit into that same formula yeah it's it's just a very very powerful card I, the, I don't think we can say really too much more about it just because it's it's such a good card <laughs> and we're just going to keep repeating ourselves because yeah, it, yeah. It's, just, it's just a great card also if you play it in a tor brand deck i mean Whew. Yeah, that, that that seems like a whole lot of a whole lot that's, of fun. That's good. As we're wrapping up here, though, there is one final note that I really feel that we need to impress before we close out. We've been talking about landfall, but remember how earlier in the show we saw some commanders that were running like an average of thirty nine lands, or some of these landfall commanders. When you look through EDH Rec, you see they're only running thirty seven lands. I think one of them I even saw was only running thirty six. I just feel like 
we, we got to have some PSA at the end of the show where we say play more lands. Like, I think that 40 is probably the minimum of what you want in a landfall deck. All of these cards are really, really delicious and they provide amazing benefits for landfall decks. But don't don't sacrifice lands to make room for all of these. I know that the new four color Omnath is appealing because he gives you more room to play all of these. You can play more stuff. But if you're taking out lands to make room for the landfall payoffs, you're working against yourself there. You need to give the lands enough room to breathe. Yeah, no, I, I can't stress this enough. You absolutely need to be running more lands in your landfall deck. Um, and in addition to that, make sure you don't go look at my mean and den deck because, <laughs> you know, conceivably it's running 36 lands and that's not a, that's not enough. Buddy! In theory, what? maybe that's perhaps not true. We don't know until we actually look. It's And, and if we don't look, we'll never know. So... Problem oh solved. I see. I feel like I'm running a low amount of lands in my Omnath deck, and that has 42. Um, I, I try to get up to. I've tried to get to 44 before, and like it's like you said, it's it's very tight there already. So yeah, it, it's 100 percent play more lands. You're going to get more landfall triggers, and the new spell lands from from this set do not count, folks. Those yeah. don't count as as lands if you're putting them in a land slot. It, my, my deck's a Schrodinger's deck. We don't know how many lands we have until we check, so we'll just assume it's the right amount for now. No, it's just, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of the impulse to play, you know, other more flexible, more colors in the landfall decks. It kind of hints towards that trend that you were talking about there, Matt. And, and I know that we want to play all the cool stuff in the land deck, but it is better to focus the deck's win conditions and then play enough lands to support that strategy that you've chosen, those win conditions that you want, rather than spreading yourself too thin and not having enough fuel in the tank for the landfall deck to do what the landfall deck needs to do. So spicy and enchanting is all of these cards are make sure that you're prioritizing the lands as well because they are very important very important all right with that what i think we need to do is call this episode to a close there's a whole bunch of juicy amazing delicious landfall stuff going on there but we're gonna have to see how they all unfold into the uh into the main meta of commander guys this was a whole lot of fun i can't wait to be destroyed by so many of these cards and if our listeners want to get in touch with us where is it that they can find us so you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. You can also find us twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast. We're streaming Wednesday evenings, having all sorts of fun. We have Jason Alt coming up here shortly. So make sure you tune in for all the dad jokes just to make him so, so <laughs> flustered. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach. You can hear me a few times a week on my other podcast, CMDR Central. And you can find all of us at patreon.com slash EDH Retcast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me on Twitter at Joseph M. Schultz. You can also find the cast at EDH Retcast on both Facebook and Twitter. And if you have a question, you can contact us at EDHRetcast at gmail.com. Our thanks again to Josh Lequai and the entire team at the Command Zone for handling the post-production work on the podcast. And of course, our thanks to our sponsors, TCG Player and CardKingdom.com. You can find them using the price info links on EDHREC or by visiting CardKingdom.com slash EDHREC. And that shows your support for the show as well. We will be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. <laughs>